Francesca. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so, thank you very much for coming here. COVID-19 and the gender gap, why to talk about that? Um, we uh, know that uh, the workplace closures have created an economic shock, not only on the supply chain, uh, but also on the demand side. In particular, we are now aware of the fact that um, COVID-19 um, has uh, uh, created uh, um, an impact uh, on the uh, working hours uh, um, four times greater than the one during the global financial crisis in 2007-2008. Uh, and uh, despite the adoption of a lot of government uh, fiscal packages and the vaccines campaigns, uh, we are uh, speaking about uh, a loss of 112 million full-time jobs. So what that, does it mean? Uh, recession, of course. And uh, uh, the conflict in Ukraine is making, of course, it worse. Um, and what is uh, the result of this recession? Uh, one of the most uh, important consequences, of course, is always uh, in all the recessions that we have experienced uh, the exacerbation of uh, inequalities. Inequalities uh, among countries, inequalities among fact sector of production, inequalities among enterprises, and of course, among group of workers, and in particular, women. Um, we know, for example, that uh, in 2020, the women's employment uh, um, de declined in the work participation has been 5% uh, compared with the 3.9% for men. And uh, what are the reasons? We know that the sector most affected by the pandemic seems to be those in which women are most employed. The female workforce perform non-standard jobs, so they more likely than men end up losing their jobs. And then the measures to contain the virus has increased the unequal distribution of unpaired care work affecting women disproportionately, as always we know. So um, why is this phenomenon of the gender gap worrying? This phenomenon is absolutely worrying because in addition to being an unfair phenomenon, it creates negative socioeconomic consequences that, uh, as it has been demonstrated, can have a bad impact on the GDP. And this phenomenon is much more worrying about the fact, because of the fact sex disparities were already high before the pandemic. These are the numbers about the gender gap in the workforce at the international level, at the European Union level, and in Italy. And what you, you, we can see is that it's, uh, it was pretty higher uh, before. So the real problem is how, how uh, to tackle the exacerbation of the gender gap in labor market in a period of recession like this one we are living in. There is no doubt about the importance in times like that of long-term policies able to counteract this trend. But since most of the tools are economically expensive, and as said, we are living in a recessionary scenario, it's very important to try to find out tools which could be effective, but as inexpensive as possible. And this is why we have decided to take under consideration the so-called pink quota system. What are pink quotas? As we know, pink quotas are um, a mechanism that reserve a percentage of job position for women. So taking for granted the legitimacy of such measures since uh, they are contemplated by the law, and so ignoring the albeit important debate about the fairness of this kind of disposition, 
the aim of this work uh, is to address the pink quota system in the workplace in two very different countries, Italy and Japan, to see if this kind of mechanism is used and how. So far, Italy has developed uh, the quota system only in one sector. Uh, we are speaking about uh, the Gulf of Mosca law in 2011 and renewed uh, in uh, 2019. And uh, uh, using this uh, um, system, the idea is that uh, to tackle the imbalance between men and women in the, in the administrative and control bodies of listed companies and unlisted public companies, um, there are some gender balance obligations. So, uh, before seeing the data to see if it is working in Italy, I would like to stress that the European Union has not done anything so far about that, even if it tried. But uh, on the other hand, we have to stress that uh, the European Union is in favor of this quota system. Instead, Mr. Mario Draghi, um, in one of the first uh, speech uh, in 2021, said that he is against the pink quota system, saying that it's not important. So this is why we think that it's very important to look at the data to see if actually in these 10 years uh, has worked the system. And we could say that, yes, if you look at the data, if you would like to see our paper, you'll see that uh, actually the number of women uh, in the administrative and um, control bodies of the companies uh, has increased compared to the, um, the, the, the other uh, um, uh, actors uh, that are not using the um, Golfo uh, Mosca system. But to be told, it's important to say also that the women um, at the high level are stuck to the minimum prescribed by the law. So what's happening so far, uh, we are stuck to comply to the law. Um, so what we are implying is that, uh, does it mean that it's uh, not useful? No, we are thinking that it's useful, but it's not enough. So the cultural change should, should be done using more and more this kind of uh, uh, tool. Thank you, Francesca, for your presentation about Italy. Let's move to Japan then now. <clears throat> so about Japan, uh, first of all, I think it's interesting to explain why we decided to compare Italy with Japan and why is Japan interesting in this comparison. And I think that reasons are mainly two. One, that Japan is one of the few uh, member states of the OECD that doesn't implement mandatory uh, gender quotas like the pink quotas in Italy. But at the same time, it's a country where uh, the discussion about positive action and gender quotas has been going on for a very long time, starting from the 80s. And even right now, it is very well known. The term positive action is very well known. So, in fact, in Japan, we can see that there is even some legal basis for positive action. So the ground is actually ready to implement something like pink quotas if the government really wanted to do that. And, for example, in the Basic Act for Gender Equal Society, there is a definition of positive action. And there are also some obligations, but there are obligations on the government, basically, uh, to develop uh, plans to um, uh, improve gender equality. But these plans are not mandatory. So inside these plans that are updated by the government every now and then, we can even find something similar to gender quotas, but they're not mandatory. So if companies doesn't do anything, there is no sanction. So of course, as you can imagine, they don't work very well. Um, another very important law in this, in this area of positive action is this law with a very long name, Act on the Promotion of the Female Participation and Career Advancement in the Workplace. This is the most recent piece of legislation from 2015, and it introduced some mandatory obligations for companies. But as you can see, they're, they're not about quotas. They're only uh, about um, transparency, actually. So these companies have to disclose data on how many women they employ, what the percentage of women. And also, they have to devise an action plan to correct 
uh, issues within the company and to submit this plan to the government. But once again, as you can imagine, this system is a very soft system. It's not like pink quotas, mandatory gender quotas with sanctions and so on. And also the scope of the law is very limited because it's only about company with over 300 employees. And uh, so what about gender quotas then? The mandatory gender quotas and pink quotas, could they be introduced in Japan? As I said before, there is a definition of positive action in the law, and but at the same time, actually in Japan for a very long time, there has been a very long discussion and heated discussion about the compatibility with mandatory gender quota with the Japanese constitution, because there was a risk of reverse discrimination, according to Japanese. However, even if today we don't have time to talk about the details, um, the scholars that studied this topic have concluded that it is compatible. They would be compatible with the Japanese constitution, so this is not a problem anymore, it seems. However, still Japan, at least until now, has adopted, as I was saying, a kind of soft approach using these basic national basic plans that are not mandatory, so there are no sanctions, and so some companies comply and some others don't. And this has resulted in a very slow process that is also showed uh, in the data. Uh, what I did in this research was to collect the data from starting from after the Second World War to nowadays. And what we can see, although this is probably very small, you don't, cannot see the numbers, I think, but you can see the curve. And you can see that until the 80s, basically, this is the amount of the proportion of women uh, the, in, uh, in uh, proportion of women workers, and the shorter line is the proportion of women in managerial position. And as you can see, actually, it, it has not been going very well in some years, it has been going back. Instead, starting from the 80s, the situation has started to gradually um, getting better, but uh, well, again, you cannot see the numbers, but the uh, improvements have been very small. We cannot see any acceleration as the one that was showed by Francesca for Italy. And again, it, and we cannot see any specific acceleration in years where some new uh, gender equality legislation was implemented. So basically, from this data, we can see that the legislation has no effect. Uh, but what is recently changing is that also in Japan, there is more interest toward diversity in the workplace and especially more in general toward sustainability in a broader sense. So that's why I think that what Japan is trying to do right now is to build like a national consensus to maybe implement something like mandatory quota in the future in case these quotas are not reached by companies on their own, basically. And as mentioned by uh, Francesca in the beginning, now there is also the additional issue of COVID that hit especially women. And so also Japan is thinking about other ways to help women employment that might not be too expensive for the state, such as uh, mandatory quotas. To conclude, <laughs> to sum up our conclusions, uh, also getting uh, um, referring to what Francesca said about the first part, what we learn uh, with this research is that um, uh, these gender quotas, yes, they are a stretch, they are uh, some a tool that is probably meant to be temporary, but at the same time we can see that it has uh, effect, an effect, as Francesca said. Uh, the problem is that it has an effect only in that small area where it is applied. And we can see it clearly in the case of Japan, where there are no mandatory quotas, this never happened. So in, if in the future quotas were to be introduced, probably they would have an effect, but only very limited. This does not mean that, the, that this tool doesn't work, but it means, as Francesca said for the first part, that probably it must be, it should be maybe expanded also to other areas, to different companies and so on. And at the same time, even if we didn't have time to talk about it in the presentation and even in the paper, because it's very uh, complex, the, talking about the economic benefits of a diverse workforce, the, there is no uh, conclusive research about that. So we don't really know if having a more diverse workplace is actually better for the economy or not. But in terms of values, if you um, agree that it is better to have more women working, and not only women, but also other categories, so people with disabilities, foreigners, and so on, it makes sense to actually uh, study these kind of tools and try to develop and implement them. And that's it. In conclusion. Thank you. <laughs> Since the paper, as you will see, are quite different one from the other, we, uh, well, I suggested as a chair uh, to have a five-minute discussion 
just after this paper so that please if there are any specific question to the paper please uh, do them and uh, but also at the end we will profit from the presence of maria grazia militello from university of catania to wrap up the session and have a more uh, heterogeneous discussion on the paper so uh, are there any questions specific to them uh, um, please, uh, I, I think that there is a mic that can uh, be passed by by our assistant and I thank him for being uh, so uh, efficient. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the interesting research. Um, I want to ask something about the Japan because I know that uh, the gender inequality is very high in the Japan because the women must even if they are educated, tend to stay at home and take care of the kids. Do you think that a kind of gender quota in this kind of society would help or there must be some other measures to help gender quota to work? I, I would like to hear your thoughts about it. Thank you. Maybe we can collect uh, or if there are, uh, are there any other questions? Yes, if you can uh, note. Yes. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. Maybe you can present yourself. Because yeah. Not, oh, do you want to no, present? We, we will know her in a second, but please. Uh, OK, please. so I'm Camilla Spadavecchia from Tilburg University. Uh, thank you for a very, very interesting presentation. Um, I was wondering, like, I have a couple of questions. First, in terms of the perception of the quotas from the population and also the managers in general in the companies, and the women, because we know also that from other studies that um, women perceive the quotas in a very negative way for themselves because they feel that it brings more discrimination when they reach a top position. Um, do you know anything about the situation both in Japan and in Italy about that? And do you think that applying this quota uh, system in Japan um, or did, did you encounter any difference in terms of uh, quotas in terms of big corporations and small medium enterprises in terms of company? Yeah. Thank you very much. Is there any other question? Well, while uh, someone uh, else would like to pose a question, I would like to ask you something in, in uh, basically taking also the point uh, that uh, has been just uh, raised by uh, Seren Pazim. So that is uh, this point. Uh, Basically, um, what you were saying about Japan and what also Seren uh, was uh, reminded us is that there are women also with highly educated not getting into the labor market. And uh, uh, also it struck me the fact that uh, the gender equality plan is mandatory. mandatory? Is, ma is it going to be mandatory late uh, now or not? No, for now, no. But uh, anyway, it, maybe in the future uh, it is um, considered uh, only for firms with more than 300 uh, uh, regular workers. So it might be not uh, the case where most women are employed. So I encourage maybe in a, in a new paper to explore better these, uh, these things. And also because it could be a very interesting case because in Italy we had quotas. We could see that they are effective in getting women on board. But on the other hand, um, for instance, uh, very, very recently, we have now the uh, um, biannual uh, report for the condition, the inequality, con uh, the structure of employment in terms of uh, gender uh, becoming compulsory and seriously compulsory uh, by uh, from uh, firms uh, with more than 50, I would say now, also um, a new a new norm. So it could be very interesting to see what is going on uh, in Italy, also in the future, as compared to a country like Japan. Also considering the fact that uh, we hope there will be a boost in uh, the policies for childcare facilities. And so to see the comparison of the two countries seems to be very interesting to have a look. But also I wanted to be a bit critical. Uh, uh, well, I'm convinced that uh, diversity is good uh, for uh, at micro level. I agree that uh, it is still ambiguous to what extent it can be um, really performance increasing for the firm. But it is definitely um, a value uh, that could be achieved. But I wonder, uh, given that the fact that uh, the data in Italy that you showed us are really showing that uh, um, given that 
uh, th there is uh, this uh, mandatory of uh, board of quota in board, uh, but there must be still a uh, mandatory because we know that uh, the law has been uh, renewed since uh, without the law, we are not so optimistic that it could be really reached. But uh, up to now, it seems to me that uh, these, uh, one of the problem is that having women on board seems not to have produced more diversity in the firms. That is uh, why is it so and how we can do in order to improve uh, this situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Sorry for the many questions. Or is there anything else? No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I can start with a question about Japan and then, okay. So starting from the first, it was about the like gender quotas, if they would work basically in Japan, considering that this issue about women is very uh, old issue and a structural issue actually. So gender quotas, of course, they just tackle one small part and they might be useful to jumpstart the system. But uh, as uh, as you probably have imagined, yeah, it would, in, in in the long term, it would be necessary to have like a cultural shift. So of course, we we need also other actions in inside the society. Quotas are just a very small, extremely small part that hopefully will have like a spillover effect to other parts of the society. But we don't really know, and maybe they won't. So yeah. And the second question was about our quotas. If they're perceived as negative in Japan. Uh, at least I will talk about Japan and then Francesca will talk about Italy. Um, well, uh, for Japan, um, yes, to be perceived as negative. Uh, even by scholars for a very long time, there was a lot of criticism. And as I mentioned in the presentation, for example, also about the compatibility with the constitution and so on, but also in the general population and even by women that, of course, they don't like to be put on boards just because it's mandatory. They would like to be selected because of their skills. So this is kind of a general, I would say, issue about quotas because the same per perception is also in Europe. And once again, it is just we see it as a tool to, to jumpstart the system. So and, and moreover, as a temporary tool, it's not as something that has to go on forever, but as to make a change now and hopefully the change will stay also in the future and then quotas can be like abolished and we won't need them anymore. So that's the hope for the future. And then you asked that it was an interesting, very interesting question that if there is a difference between big corporation and small enterprises, this is actually true because big corporations in Japan are much more interested in diversity. Also for, how can I say, like for a reason of like image, they want to look better abroad because they are multinational, so they operate abroad. And so, of course, from their point of view, if they can uh, tell other companies that they employ many, for example, women, foreigners and so on, they will look better and get more clients probably also from abroad. Instead, for small companies, it's much more difficult. Also because maybe they have less employees and maybe they cannot find actually women that would be able to do the job that they need. So they have much, much more issues. So yeah, there is actually a very big difference uh, within Japan. And then there was the question about the, um, the mandatory system for like companies employing more than 300 employees. Um, that are probably the kind of company, actually, no, they're, they're the company that em, they em, employ many women, actually, also. Uh, but yeah, it is true that it is not, it is just a very small uh, part of the, of course, of the, of the society. And in fact, that law that act on, on the act on the promotion of blah, 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 <laughs> 2015, um, that act has been criticized because the scope was too small. So these companies are just a very small number. And in fact, what happened is that very recently, so starting from this year, actually April this year, the scope of that um, law has been expanded to companies employing more than 100 employees. So they're trying to uh, expand it and maybe they will expand it even more in the future. So they're going basically step by step, but maybe it will be it will become more uh, effective in the future. Yeah. And I think I think maybe I covered all the questions, I think. Yeah. But, but. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the inch. Uh, thank you for your questions. I only would like to add that uh, um, I don't think that there are data uh, about uh, how uh, people are reacting to the quota systems in Italy. Um, I'm aware of the fact that uh, there are a lot of women against uh, the pink quotas. To be honest, uh, if I would say, uh, I was at the beginning very skeptical about this uh, tool. After studying that, I understood that instead, this is a space that we have to take, absolutely. 
because it's part of the cultural change. And if we remember also after, you know, the Second World War, when uh, they decided to cover women for the maternity leaves and so on, there were so many women against that because of the cost of work increased. But uh, I think that it was uh, such a good idea to find that battle. And I'm quite sure that is, uh, we are more or less in, in the same place. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would say that uh, you will uh, profit from many visiting uh, period uh, between uh, Cobb University and University of Milan because it's, it seems to be very uh, stimulating, stimulating uh, your research, really. Thank you. Thank so you much. very much. And uh, thank, you. thank you also for the time. So now we are going to have Seren Kazim from uh, George August University of Gottingen. Um, while uh, uh, Kazim is, uh, okay, uh, so she has uh, also a PhD at the Faculty of Law at the Department for Labor Law on the relation between the law on protection against dismissal and the anti-discrimination law. And before she had worked as lawyer after studying law at Ankara University. Um, so basically uh, we can consider uh, Kazim, labor law and anti-discrimination law specialist, and currently she's working, as you will see, on violence against women workers. She uh, and uh, actually the paper she's going to present uh, is going to deal uh, with uh, what is happening basically uh, in uh, terms of violence against women with remote work. So the floor is yours. I will Thank you very much. Sign. You can hear me, don't you? Yes, perfect. Yes, uh, I'm Joanne Kassam. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, we don't we have the limited time, so I'm beginning so not to make uh, so much fuss. Uh, in my presentation uh, this morning, I will briefly introduce my research on specific problems uh, faced by women workers in Turkey who are working remotely in their homes during the COVID-19 pandemic with the aim to analyze legal measures set out by lawmakers to address the problems. Great. <laughs> Firstly, uh, I'm going to look at the remote work practice and increasing domestic violence uh, during the pandemic. Secondly, I will move to do uh, issue of private public dichotomy and anti-gender movements. And lastly, I will focus on the legal regulations in Turkey. I chose this as the last pass, uh, part. If it's does working, you can read my paper and we can discuss it later. Um, so following the outbreak of the COVID-19 and after it spread around the world, declaration of the WHO, that constitutes a pandemic, the Turkish authorities impose drastic restrictions all over the world in order to stop or at least slow down the spread. In this context, many companies either started or continued to work remotely beginning of the March 2020. You can see in the slide now. Uh, some well-known companies and powerful companies uh, have already stated they aim to make remote work uh, permanent after the, perma uh, after the COVID-19 restrictions are over. They even started their own programs, which are there, you can see there. And it looks like that remote work uh, will remain commonplace once the pandemic is over in Turkish labor market, at least for a while. But actually, due to the COVID-19 restrictions implemented in Turkey, remote work had an extended mandatory character. Yesterday, we were also talking about it in the first uh, session about it, I think, and many types of work during the pandemic. Mm, it was Teresa's presentation, yes. Moreover, due to the curfews and terrible restrictions, remote work had been limited to the workers' home offices. In this way, paid work and the unpaid work have coincided in the same place and raising questions regarding where the paid work starts and where it ends. Yes, uh, in particular, remote work in home office practiced by women workers challenges the long criticized public private dichotomy, in my opinion. In, we know in the Western liberal democratic tradition, the creation of a division of public and private spheres has functioned as a political tool that inter alia defines the regulatory limits of the state. 
but also in a way the women are bonded to the private sphere as presented in family and the men are inextricably linked to the public does the public private dichotomy not only reflects but also reproduces in many ways and creates gender based inequality in the society and regardless of the ambiguousness and obscurity of these boundaries, which has been criticized by feminists, especially for years, the understanding of public and private dichotomy has still has an effect on our regulatory systems, including Turkey. At that point, remote work practiced in the home office mixes up public-private division by bringing the public work from the public world of work into the private sphere at home, into the castle of the private non work actually. And, but public-private division stays same. For example, according to a survey, women in Turkey had been almost twice as likely to switch to working from home as men during the pandemic. In parallel, the working hours and workload of women, both unpaid and paid work, was increased drastically. And we see that during this thing, there, the, there was a great visibility of traditional or conservative uh, gender roles in the society. And patriarchal gender roles have also been supported by different state regulations. And this regulation, which I want to mention, uh, gives the pregnant women and female staff with children under 10 years age and ad administrative leave during the pandemic restrictions. By contrast, male civil servants, it was directed to the civil servants, are exempted from the regulation. I think it demonstrates how the state perceives women workers in society as mothers, uh, child carers, and those naturally responsible for reproduction and nurturance. Um, as large numbers of workers instructed to work remotely from home offices during the pandemic, everything at home became actually work related, including domestic violence. Globally, even before the pandemic, um, one in three women, according to UN data, reported experiencing physical or sexual violence. And OECD data from the 29 shows that 38% 30 per, of the women in Turkey had experienced physical or sexual violence. It's mostly from the intimate partners. And about the situation during the COVID-19 pandemic, many different studies give the similar results. You can see them there. Violence against women increased during the pandemic. Indeed, at the same time as the all kinds of violence against women increased during the pandemic strict in Turkey, Turkey denounced its withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention on March 2021. Turkey's withdrawal uh, is related especially with the rising of an anti-gender movement in Turkey. The anti-gender movement is a transnational movement uh, that organizes itself around the critique of the concept of gender, which they called as the gender ideology. It dates back to 1990s. It's, I mean, it's very commonplace actually in the US, Poland, Hungary, um, Turkey in last, um, I think uh, since 2011, but especially after 2019, um, it sees this gender, anti-gender movement sees it was in the nature of sex for women to do domestic work and for men to undertake action in public life. So you can see they have a very different idea of the social life. And gender see as seen as a gender is a danger. But as Butler states, the aim of this movement is not only to eliminate the word gender uh, or outlaw the so-called theory of gender, but to undermine the justification of a wide range of policies. For example, I could give an example from Turkey. It was 2011 when they uh, closed the Minister of State for Women and Family. Instead, they built a ministerium for family and social policies because the aim is to protect family, not the women. 
regarding the gender-based violence, according to two, this movement um, theorists, they call, in quotation, uh, they call for an opposition to intrafamilial violence rather than gender-based violence, pointing out that men can be victims too. And in this context, uh, Istanbul Convention was simply a target as they include the definition of gender and the understanding of gender itself. This brings me to the last section of my presentation, and I want to introduce the regular regulations during the pandemic restrictions regarding the protection of women workers working remote in home offices during the pandemic. I think I want to start with the regulations uh, dealing with the um, remote work. The Turkey is neither a party to ILO 177 uh, nor to the EU framework on telework, uh, but an amendment from 2016 uh, to the Labour Act um, acknowledged remote work as a type of employment in Turkey. And 2016 amendment, but there was a trick, uh, they said that this, the details of the remote work employment relationship will be determined by a regulation. But for this regulation, the uh, contract parties had to wait until March 2021. So when they started to work remotely, they didn't have a, a, a detailed regulation how this should work. After 2021 March, they, okay, a remote work regulation. Now we have the remote work regulation. The important part is the remote work regulation. Um, main variables of the remote work depending on the existence of a mutual agreement between parties. Considering the typical imbalance in the trend uh, between the parties of the employment contract, in my opinion, it is a clear that regulation favors flexibility for employers over the security of the employees because it is not to wait from okay. uh, employee to fight for employees to fight for their rights during the um, du during the employment contract. And there is uh, one essential provision which could be helpful for the women, Article 14.5. It entitles the workers whose employment contract was converted, converted to remote work to request to work at the workplace again in form of indicated. It's a very um, detailed for, uh, formulation how it should proceed about the procedure. And um, by this way, suitability for remote working due to the nature of the job and the worker should be a criterion. And in Turkish uh, literature, it is said that the employer's duty of care includes, among other things, the protection of workers' personality, life, health and bodily integrity. And if the employer is aware of the domestic violence of, a, of the worker's experience or uh, could experience, the employer's duty of protection requires an action of the employer. In that case, after a request from the employee, employer should uh, change the uh, from remote work to the other, uh, from the work from the office. And there is also the occupational health and safety precautions, which could be understandable as domestic violence is actually a um, health and safety issue. And um, now, lastly, regarding to the domestic violence, as I said, uh, Turkey is not a party of the Istanbul Convention uh, anymore, and it's also not a party to ILO Convention 190, but Turkey is a part of the CEDA, which we can call as the mother of the Istanbul Convention. Uh, but we could also, I would like to point out that CEDA um, aims to protect the women. What is the great difference between Istanbul Convention as uh, Istanbul Convention also has an understanding of the gender? I think Turkish constitution is a, is, could be a powerful source because the Article 10 of the Constitution says that everybody should be treated equally, it's an anti-discrimination clause, and as violence against women is a violation of human rights and a form of discrimination against women, in my opinion, states should take positive actions to protect women against violence. Also, there's also a very uh, powerful code, uh, Trade Union and Collective Agreement Act, says, 
uh, trade unions should pay attention to gender equality in their activities. This obligation could also be interpreted such as activities, uh, including uh, preventing domestic violence. Lastly, I would like to mention the Turkish National Act on the Protection of Family and Prevention of Violence Against Women. Uh, this is the um, this was the act actually um, it, it is aim is to protect uh, sex-based dis discrimination and sex-based violence. What I want to point out, it's the word is the woman, not the gender, so it is an another concept. But promisingly, the act uh, has some regulations which could help women workers. A judge can prohibit the prohibitor from approaching to the protect person's workplace, which is in, in remote work, where is the workplace, could be a challenging situation for the judge. A judge can also decide to alter the workplace of the victim. Constitutional court decided if a woman who is a victim of violence requests a change of workplace, but this is rejected, her right to protect her material and moral existence is violated. So this should be, uh, this should, the parties, the employer has to uh, accept this uh, accept this request. And also the act also states if the protected person works and has children, nursery kindergarten facilities are to be provided for a limited period of two months to support the participation of the protected person in the working life. Unfortunately, and, and I'm finishing, uh, women organizations pointed out that 2021, uh, 33 of the 280 victims of femicides did actually previously filed complaints to authorities and already had a restraining order. So I don't know if it could be helped. But promisingly, again, 2021 Constitutional Court demanded the prosecution of public officials who did not take adequate preventive protective measures in case of a femicide. Constitutional Court ruled that the deceased had her life, uh, deceased right to life was violated. So to sum up, uh, unfortunately during the pandemic crisis, neither the individual needs of the women workers nor the women workers as a group was adequately considered. In this consider, in conference, we are examining human-centered recovery possibilities after the COVID-19 pandemic. In my opinion, based on the example of the Turkey, uh, I think a human-centered recovery should address the specific needs of the women workers as a group in light of the complex and intersectional nature of the discrimination they experience. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, are there any questions from the floor? Please, uh, uh, there is a question there. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Um, I was wondering, because you were talking about this uh, anti-gender movement, and the importance that this stakeholder uh, had in, uh, in shaping the policies uh, of the country. What are the other stakeholders that are in, in, in par part of this process as well, besides, uh, of course, the government itself, the anti-gender movement? I'm thinking about other groups uh, from, social, from the society that might act and counteract what they did. Do you see that there might be any changes uh, thanks to the action of other groups? Um, yeah, in this. Uh, well, I have a connected question, if you don't mind. A connected question to this one. Okay. Uh, basically, I would like to tell you that uh, uh, in this university, we had the privilege to have uh, one visiting professor from Turkey, Professor Gulay Gunluk uh, Senesen, and uh, we have just know that also next year we are going to have uh, Yelda Yusel from uh, Bilge mm -hmm. University um, as visiting professor for our PhD um, school. And um, I will be involved, I am also involved in this research group. <clears throat> and I could see, uh, because you were very, very, very uh, um, well uh, um, showing us what is going on by law, what could be done, and what uh, has not been done, and, 
um, and is uh, preventing uh, really the protection of uh, workers, especially women that are more subject to violence at their home. Um, I wonder whether there can be alliances with um, cities, like mm -hmm. I know that there are women-friendly cities from mm -hmm. uh, um, that has been uh, that are in in uh, Turkey, mm -hmm. uh, because I've heard about project before the pandemics to have uh, co-working places, uh, so that uh, in that case they can do remote work, but they can do remote work in a safer place and with other people. So I wonder whether that could be uh, something uh, feasible. But are there other questions from the floor? If not, please uh, okay. go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, this is anti-gender movement is a very interesting um, movement. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, there are campaigns. They started in 1990s after the Cairo, Cairo um, summit in uh, of the UN. There UN used the word gender for the first time in its um, history, that's right. And um, the first, um, uh, it came from the Pepst. He said that he doesn't like it and he wants the change. So it's actually a Christian, um, Catholic Christian movement it started. And then they started a family bond or something like that, where they theorized their uh, ideas about how it should, how gender is bad for the society, where the place of the woman is, and how these kind of the regulations have negative effects on the um, holy family or something like that. And then this movement spread all around the world. It started from the Catholic uh, conservative movement to the evangelist Catholic conservative movement. And as I remember from the Özkazan, she is a professor from Turkey, she also mentions how it's then during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, combined with the anti-vaccine movement. So yeah, there is a very anti-movement who, who sees a very, who is afraid of everything going around, especially gender and women equality. When we came to the Turkey, uh, Turkey, it, it's, it's what the sociologist interesting finds is that this uh, mostly a Christian uh, concept of anti-gender movement uh, moved to the Turkey and was accepted by the religious, Islamic religious parties. So they, they accepted it and they advocated it. It started in 2011 and 2019 had the similar uh, with the, um, had, um, how do you say, parallel, parallel, became parallel with the international transnational movement. And in this context, um, these religious, Islamic religious parties are uh, for this and some state parties, um, political parties, uh, um, accepting this idea and uh, Mm. trying to widespread it around. And what are the other parties? Women movement, especially in the last five years, Turkish women movement is incredibly powerful. They are doing everything they have in their hands to change the life of the women in the Turkey and including working life because it's the most, most important part of the uh, human life which allows us to have a, a free and um, economically powerful possible uh, life uh, to live. And yes, in this, when we think about the allies and we have the, especially of one, one on the one hand, we have the women movement and on the other hand, we have the unfortunate state uh, and political parties and the religious groups. So they, they they are fighting and but if, if maybe you, you you couldn't yeah it was turkish but most of the data that i used in my uh, study are from the data from the turkish uh, women rights movements because they mostly uh, are not similar with the turkish state data so this is also very interesting uh, and also it shows how the state perceives the situation. And the possibilities, uh, this 
uh, gender, uh, also women work in remote spaces. They, I think they are very important, especially for this time of being, when this uh, anti-gender moment is so powerful, it gives the people the chance to have a free space. And yes. um, But in my opinion, we also should uh, not forget, we have been talking about this, the aim is the structural change. I mean, they help, of course, this kind of places or cities, but the aim should be in the end a structural change, and this cannot be achieved without having a political fight, actually, against those understanding, which has effect not everyday life, and especially, as, we, as I already tried to show, on the law, uh, also on our rights. So thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, thank uh, thank we can uh, go ahead uh, talking thank about you. this. It's, it has been really very interesting and uh, very challenging for thank you very much. you. And, uh, so thank you very much. And I'm going to invite uh, Melanie Regin Ak. She is an associate professor at the Faculty of Law, University of Bergen, Norway. She holds a PhD uh, in law at Oslo University. Oslo University. She has been head of division of diversity, uh, inclusion, internationalization, and she has been visiting uh, uh, in many universities in the USA, in the UK, and also in Munich. Research areas deal with the intersection of labor and social security law, uh, with the view of the Europeanization and internationalization of both areas of law. The floor is now mm -hmm. definitely She's yours nice. for presenting uh, this paper that is going to focus on the working life out of balance, legal responses in the uh, European Union and Norway. Please, the floor is yours. I will keep the time. Thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. I just had to adjust to the uh, technologies. And right now, I'm a little overwhelmed about all the interesting speeches uh, you gave and yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, now I would like to give you a glimpse of um, how, sorry, how the regulations in Norway are. And first of all, I would like to thank um, the foundation for giving me the opportunity to present my paper here. Yeah, my ta my paper is entitled uh, "Working Life Out of Balance: Legal Responses in the EU and Norway to Parenthood and Caregiving in Times of Crisis." We heard it already today. The Corona pandemic was the long-awaited wake-up call for a digitalized working life, blurring the lines between working and private life. And it became clear that digitization in working life can be both a blessing and a curse. Working life for employees with families and caregiving responsibilities was more than often felt out to be felt to be out of balance. Existing inequalities were even exacerbated, in particular for female employees. And this was even the case for Norway, being on the forefront when it comes to gender equality in the workplace and being on the cutting edge regarding digitalization in working life. In addition, the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic hit European societies at a point in time when Europe already, already was faced with a massive challenge, as it was and still is going through a period of drastic demographic transformation that also has a profound impact on working life. With an increase of older people, many countries, including Norway, are confronted with an aging of their workforce. In view of that, concerns have been expressed on how employees may be able to address the needs not only of their immediate family members, but of their ex extended families as well, that is elderly parents, disabled or ill relatives. As only recently in 2020 stressed by Statistics Norway, is the country aging at an increasing pace and a historic shift will take place within less than 10 years from now. As by the year 2030, for the first time, there will be more elderly people than children. This turning point is illustrated in this table. In striving for work-life balance, two factor factors that we have touched upon already play a decisive role. First, the availability of working time arrangements 
And second, the availability of various forms of paid leave. In my article, I focus on the latter and analyze the right to paternity, including um, the leave for co-mothers and carers leave in the recently enacted European Union's Work-Life Balance Directive and how it impacts Norwegian law. Yeah, you can see most of it. <laughs> Uh, the, work, the WLB directive, Work-Life Balance Directive, is the most recent piece of EU gender le legislation. It is the very first legal instrument that emerged from the European Pillar of Social Rights, EPSR, the latter being by its very legal nature an interinstitutional proclamation. The second instrument that you can see here is the Directive on Predictable and Transparent Working Conditions, but I focused only on the WLB Directive. In contrast to the Gender Equality Directives that are already in force, the WLB Directive pursues a new approach to gender equality in working life, as it specifically aims at not only enhancing the conditions for women, but establishing incentives for men to engage in family and care work as well. The WLB Directive introduces, in short, five central instruments to achieve work-life balance. First, the four months of parental leave for each of the parents that have been established by Directive 2010 is to be continued, but, and that, that is important, the so-called non-transferable part is to be increased from one to two months to each of the parents. In addition, a requirement is introduced that these two months that are non-transferable must be paid. Second, on the occasion of birth, the right to 10 days paid leave is introduced and the payment of this leave must be at least at the level of the national sickness benefit. And third, important with regard to demographic change, the right to five days of carer's leave per employee for every calendar year is introduced. Fourth, the right to flexible arrangements in the employment relationship is strengthened as employees may, for example, request flexible work schedules or reduced working hours. And finally, I think you cannot see it on the list here, but it's the last point. The directive requires establishing protection against discrimination for employees who claimed these rights or applied for such rights. EU member states shall in principle implement the directive into the national laws very soon, namely by 2nd of August. When it comes to Norway, the legal situation is however somewhat special as the country is not a member of the European Union. As for its legal status, the WLB Directive is now under scrutiny for incorporation into the EEA agreement. But the Joint Committee has not yet decided whether the directive should be incorporated or not, which means that de legalata, Norway is thus not bound to implement the WLB Directive. The Norwegian legislator, however, only recently proposed to amend the existing parental leave provisions in the National Insurance Act, the Folketrücklov, by strengthening, inter strengthening inter alia fathers and co-mothers' individual right to parental benefits. It has been stressed by the Norwegian government, I quote, there is nothing to prevent Norway from introducing the changes in question before we are committed to it. Before I go into the upcoming amendments, let's take a quick look back. Norway was worldwide the forerunner and considered a role model when it comes to paternity leave. It was the first country in the world that introduced an earmarked father quota of four weeks as early as 1993. When introduced back then, back then the father quota had a length of four weeks. If the father did not use the leave, it would lapse, and this rule still applies today. As you can see on the uh, left-hand side, the paternity quota was later extended several times, and it was uh, latest, lately extended in 2018 and has now 18, sorry, and has now um, a length of 15 weeks. On this table, I try to illustrate the development. In short, uh, the legalata, the parental benefit scheme, it's 
in the details rather complicated, but to give you an overview, it consists of uh, th mainly three parts. One um, reserved for the mother, the mother quota consisting of 18 weeks, the father slash co-mother quota consisting of 15 weeks, and a common part that can be divided between the two um, parents consisting of 16 weeks. And the withdrawal of the paternity slash co-mother leave beyond the father quota is dependent on the so-called activity requirement. That is, it requires the mother to go back to work or be another f in another form of activity, for example, education. And on the bottom, you see uh, the rights. No, you can't see it actually, but there I uh, have noted the rights to leave when it comes for the time frame close to birth. Here, the first six weeks after birth are reserved for the mother only, and um, the Working Environment Act only has the opportunity for unpaid leave of two weeks for the father slash co-mother. But there are regulations in collective agreements and in the individual um, employment contract that might, might open up uh, for paid leave in this time frame. The upcoming amendments will um, change the legal situation a little first when it comes to the mentioned activity requirement, requirement sorry, and then, you can't see it, when it comes to the two weeks close, close to birth. So, uh, in short, the uh, reform concerns Chapter 14 of the mentioned National Insurance Act. All fathers, I marked it with a star because they do not um, say otherwise, so fathers and co-mothers will, with obtained leave rights, shall be given the right to take eight weeks of parental benefit that are individual and autonomous so that they are not um, dependent on the activity requirement and fathers slash co-mothers shall be given the right to two leaves. Okay, thank you, paid leave. Oh. <laughs> to hurry. Um, close to birth. Let's now take a quick look to the regulations on uh, the right to carers leave. Article 6 is the directive's key instrument to address demographic change as it entails the entitlement for employees, as I said, to five days of leave to uh, care for relatives. However, given that the leave is not required to be paid, <clears throat> the provision may turn out to be a rather toothless tiger. Anyway, the underlying aim is to provide men and women with caring responsibilities with greater possibilities to remain in the workforce despite their additional burden of caring. As for carers' leave, the Norwegian law basically distinguishes between six scenarios in addition to situations of general leave that is related to a sick child, for example. I would like to highlight only two of these scenarios that um, have the closest similarity to the directive, namely first end-of-life care for close relatives at home where you have the opportunity of six days leave per calendar year, and second, the scenario that provides for an entitlement to leave for up to 10 days for each calendar year to provide necessary <clears throat> care to parents, spouse, cohabitant, or a registered partner. While the first scenario that I highlighted here is to be paid, um, there is no obligation um, for, for um, payment when it comes to the second scenario. Let's now take a quick look to the protection against discrimination. According to the directive, Article 11, EU member states shall take the necessary measures to prohibit less favorable treatment of workers <clears throat> that is inter alia based on the ground that they have applied for or already have taken paternity, parental or carer's leave. Since the constitutional reform in 2014, the Norwegian constitution, the Grünloven, states in paragraph 98 that everyone is equal before the law and that no human being must be subjected to unreasonable or disproportionate discrimination. Since the reform in 2018, the discrimination law regime um, encompasses also exercising, as a, since then, exercising care-related tasks is no longer linked or rather examined under the discrimination ground of gender. 
the care-related discrimination is now protected in a separate discrimination ground and thus is to be explicitly found in the catalogue of protected grounds of discrimination in the Equality and Discrimination Act central provision that you can see, unfortunately, only in Norwegian on the right-hand side here. What is important is that with the enactment of the new law, the Ministry wanted to separate care-related tasks from the prohibition against sex discrimination to make it clear that the prohibition of discrimination <clears throat> also applies where men are subject to such discrimination. Accordingly, it has been specified in the preparatory work to the Act that, I quote, discrimination against men on the basis of caring responsibilities is a far more relevant problem in today's society than it was just a few decades ago. Today, it is an expectation and a goal that men and women are equal caregivers. <laughs> what is further important here yeah, <laughs> is that the prohibition encompasses also the assumption that a person has care-related tasks. Remarkably, the example that is given for illustration in the preparatory work is that of differential treatment based on the assumption that a person that is an employee has older parents that are in need of care. Among the list of prohibited grounds of discrimination in paragraph six is furthermore discrimination related to leave for reasons of birth and adoption. Also in this regard, the, no the Norwegian legislator decided in 2018 to have a specific ground of discrimination. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Previously, such discrimination was considered a form of gender discrimination too. A recent example of such discrimination that was decided by the Anti-Discrimination Tribunal constitutes the case where a male job seeker has been rejected during an interview with a staffing agency due to impending parental leave and the tribunal concluded that the complainant was exposed to a breach of the discrimination regulations. So just, I, I guess I only have one minute left. Yeah, <laughs> so recent re critics have argued that the WLB directive already is outdated, even when it's still in, in its implementation phase, and that it needs to be critically re revisited and various aspects of the framework strengthened. Also, my comparative analysis could show that there are some important aspects that should need whatever be to change the legal ferenda. And this concerns first incre increasing the length of the non-transferal parental leave period. Originally, the uh, European Commission proposed um, that this trans transferable period should have been um, should have a length of four months and then it was watered down to two months. And same with paid carer's leave. The original proposal was that the, the leave um, of, we are talking here about five days, should be paid and it was again watered, watered down and it's not, there's no requirement that the leave should be paid. And then the problem is that the directive only applies to workers and does not cover self-employed persons and freelancers. Here, it's interesting to take a look at the Norwegian regu regulations that also encompass um, self-employed persons and freelancers. freelancers. And from a comparative angle, it's also very interesting, I, I think, to see um, uh, on the Norwegian regulation, because here you have um, two separate grounds of discrimination when it comes to take uh, carer's leave and when it comes to take leave related to uh, maternity, pater paternity or parental leave where you have uh, two separate grounds of discrimination that might strengthen um, um, or enhance substantive equality. That's something um, one might need uh, to discuss. And finally, it is hoped for the time, and I'm concluding, uh, to come that both the EU and national legislators acknowledge the diverse and multifaceted family life in the 21st century also in their legal wording, and that's why and there might be other solutions why I marked it with a star. Um, that's not only a paternity leave we are talking about, but it's also leave of co-mothers. Yeah, and thank you very much.
And uh, basically, I would like, thank you very much, it was very interesting. I have uh, many questions, but I would like uh, Maria Grazia Militello to join us now, because uh, 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 while she's going to join, I will tell you that she's Associate Professor at University of Catania in Labor Law. So, uh, excuse me, but there was uh, a little technical problem. So, um, we, uh, I, I was speaking about uh, uh, quotas, um, gender quotas. So, we know that in the context of uh, positive actions, uh, uh, the quotas have always raised the long-standing question about how to interpret substantive equality, whether it should be measured in terms of equality of op or opportunities, or results, both the opinion of those who support and those who do not are based on various arguments, less or more convincing, but you you know I, I cannot repeat here. But it is true that there is a structural discrimination in the labor market, and it's also true that the cultural approach is not easy to change. Maybe so this problem could be overcome by looking at the effects, effective results as the authors uh, uh, did, focusing, uh, for example, on the composition of the words. Some researchers have demonstrated that the words that have more women, thanks to the mandatory quota, have conditioned not only the corporate context, for example, by firing fewer workers and showing greater attention to employees' welfare, but also to uh, society as a whole, helping to raise female employment rates. So perhaps the, the problem about how to approach substantive equality uh, can um, could, uh, be overcome by choosing the redistribution approach, enhancing the differentiating function of equality as the necessary answer to a pre-existent situation of inequality as regards access to resources and opportunities that requires not only to have equal rules of the game, but also equal results until even the uh, rules of game uh, of game themselves uh, change I, I will come back to this uh, at the end the, the second paper analyzes the relation between domestic violence against uh, women and the need to work at home uh, triggered by uh, the pandemic which will probably last for a long time if not indefinitely. Professor Kazim has underlined that both the digitization of work and the pandemic with the, its extensive use of re remote work have been blurred the boundaries between private and working life. But um, they really have worsen, uh, worsened the condition of women working in the same place where they are abused, that is, in the home. In this respect, the author offers an interesting uh, perspective based on based on the one end on the consideration of the domestic violence and gender discrimination and on the other on the need to protect uh, women from domestic violence throughout the regulation of remote work by considering such abuse as violence in the workplace. I agree with this solution uh, because it encourages focusing attention on the regulation of abuse within the employment relationship by introducing enhanced rights for workers and increased obligation for employers. For example, uh, it could be a right to a special leave as uh, is provided in Italy or a right to be transferred that could be from home to the workplace or to um, a safety uh, place also. But I, I, I agree less. However, if I have understood correctly, with the suggestion that women should be considered a group, perhaps you could uh, clarify that point with us. Finally, the third paper focuses on the right to paternity and carer's leave as an instrument of work-life balance, which uh, is aimed at pro uh, promoting gender equality, at facing demographic uh, crisis, uh, and even at Im improving employees' health and employers' outcome. So a process that would seem to lead to a win-win result. But if it, if it does, the question is why work-life balance is still a goal that needs to be achieved? And moreover, even in a state like, like Norway in which uh, legislation is a role model. 
I think the question and also the, the answer <laughs> emerges uh, clearly from uh, prof the prof uh, professor's, uh, Professor Ack's paper uh, and deserves to be underlined. And is that at uh, the basis of all the, the regulations, even the more advanced ones, there is uh, still the idea that uh, leave, the leave and the parenting remains, however, mainly a mother's issue as the main part of the burden of work-life balance. This suggests uh, there is a strong and widespread resistance to a structural and cultural change, as we have seen also with regards to gender quotas. Therefore, parental leave cannot be the only answer at least not with the parental leave as we know it, where the father is always in a subordinate position. Because in the case of caring responsibilities, the problem does not only relate to stereotyped roles within the family, but also to the impact of, of what would be a personal choice on paid work. The point is that there shouldn't be uh, an impact Fathers and mothers should be able to choose how to care for their, chi for their children without worrying about the consequences on their work. In reality, at present, this is not the case, as we uh, know. The main obstacle, in my opinion, is a work and working hours organization be, uh, built mainly on employer interests, which does not take into account the worker's personal needs. We, we have more examples. Uh, of this. Unless there is an, an intervention on work regulation, the only way to equality will be by putting the fathers on an equal footing with mothers with respect not to care responsibilities, but to work, eliminating the differences for the employers in choosing a man or a woman for an, an employment or uh, a promotion. Uh, this could be achieved, for example, by introducing positive actions that make paternity leave mandatory for an equal period to maternity leave, in any case definitely longer than the 10 days pro provided by uh, the directive, for example. Moreover, overcoming the differentiation between fathers and mothers could allow all types of families to be protected, not only the traditional ones. I, I, I would just like to add a few words by way of uh, conclusion. Um, all the presentations have shown us various uh, problematic uh, conditions for women, further complicated by the pandemic and also by work-life blending uh, arising from work digitization, accelerated in turn by the pandemic, of course. At the basis of the different problems, there is a structural discrimination of women, both within labor market and family life, ossified on the one end in traditional patterns of work organization built on male breadwinner model, and on the other in a stereotyped conception of gender roles. The two aspects are inextricably connected. The real point, so, is the sexual division of work, paid work for men and paid and unpaid work for women. Most of the solutions adopted by the legislators to solve these issues fail, in my opinion, to go to the heart of the problem. That is the fact that woman condition is not comparable to any other minority group condition because women are not a minority. But because of gender equality is a social and an economic imperative now, and discrimination is a violation of human dignity, and it depends on structural mechanism, the role of law is to modify them, is to act, as long as being a woman will be no longer an obstacle. Until this happens, in this, maybe in the sectors where there is a, certi a certified and a representation, the choice of who to I should not be free. So I agree with the uh, su suggestion of uh, uh, professors Marinelli and Riminucci when they argued also that the gender quota system should be extended. In the same way, with regards uh, uh, to caring responsibilities, I think that until the choice about who cares, whether father or mother, and for how much time, will not be indifferent for employers, the choice about who cares should not be free. So the only way uh, would be to totally equate parental and carers' lives 
uh, and make uh, them mandatory, as I said. And then in addition, is necessary to strengthen the protection against discrimination on specific grounds of parenthood and caring responsibilities, as is uh, uh, already provided in Norway and as uh, uh, the directive provides also. Because considering a discrimination against a worker with care responsibilities and indirect this form of discrimination grounded on gender is itself a form of discrimination. But these are all temporary solutions indeed for the future. The need to adapt paid work to digitization could help because it represents an unmissable opportunity to adapt work organization and work in time to employees' needs, including health and security needs, as Professor Kazim has underlined. This would be a perfect opportunity for the legislators to finally adopt, as the conference title suggests, a human-centered approach. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much for the very uh, interesting, uh, stimulating uh, conclusion uh, that put together all the, all the three papers. I just uh, wonder if there is just a, a very um, brief question for, for the last paper. So I don't know if you would like to say something about uh, what uh, she was telling. I can just maybe add that um, one key that you yeah. In German, I would say Stellschraube, but one key aspect in uh, achieving substantial equality here and uh, really uh, realizing incentives for men here is to reduce the gender pay gap. As long we, as we have... I was just asking you this question, this very question, because we know that so, also in Norway, the pay gap, the disadvantage of women is uh, still there. And so this is going to affect uh, also the... the yeah, I mean, the question of who takes the leave is still the, the, a financial question. And as long as it's a financial question, we, yeah, it, yeah. So I would say that I don't know if the other has already left uh, the place. Uh, and uh, maybe you can go ahead uh, with the, the lunch break to go and uh, talk each other. And uh, thank you very much. It was really a brilliant uh, with us uh, at the distance and to the assistant. Thank you.